Hey, what's up guys? Ken here from the Retro Toy Escapades channel. So I love the Transformers. And when I was a kid in the 1980s and I couldn't get all of the Transformers toys with what little allowance I had, I spent it on the comics instead. And the 80s Transformers comics as written by writer Bob Badiansky was some of the absolute best Transformers stories to appear in any medium. Now, Bob had this tendency to throw the spotlight on random characters within the universe and make them the star of the show. Such as in issue 45's MonsterCon from Mars story, which has the Decepticon Skullgrin as the book's main star. Now, Skullgrin is one of those Decepticons that belong to a subset group called the Pretenders. The Pretenders were part of this brand new toy initiative that Hasbro undertook with the series back in 1988. So these were a group of Autobots and Decepticons that were hidden with flesh-like outer forms. The outer forms of the Autobots were human in design, while the outer forms of the Decepticons were all scary-looking monsters. The idea behind this was that, you know, the enemy would never sense the Transformers hiding within. The problem I had with this concept, especially in an Earth environment, is that the Pretenders were all the size of buildings. Now, if you saw a human, the height of a shopping mall walking about, it would be as good as Godzilla himself strolling through the street. Anyway, the story starts on a movie set with these two actors on a low-budget sci-fi flick. We learn immediately that the female actress, Carissa, is kinda cute, and the guy that's starring alongside her, Jake, is kind of a pompous douche. So they're working on a film titled Creepozoids of the Crab Nebula, and the director is this guy called Roly, who's totally losing his cool on set as he's being faced with malfunctioning props, set delays, employee tantrums, and anything else that causes a movie's budget to implode. Then a spark of inspiration hits him when he realizes that he could get a Transformer robot to appear in the movie and get the box office receipts soaring. Now, although this tale serves as a standalone one-shot of sorts, there's a lot of cool bits that tie into the larger connecting story. Now, we see the Autobot Sky Linux delivering a group of human children back to Earth who were stranded in space from a few issues back. We also see in Shadows the return of another long-standing character within the original run of Transformers, Circuit Breaker. Now, Circuit Breaker is actually a computer genius called Josie Beller, who was injured in a Decepticon attack which left her crippled. But using her mastery of electronics, she was able to heal and become something of a female Electro with the ability to fry out the circuitry of Transformer robots. Now, Circuit Breaker was a character created for the comics and was never a Hasbro toy, but she was popular enough to be added into the G1 Transformers comic saga. Now, the director, Rowley's PR guy, brings him news of a Bigfoot sighting in the nearby hills, believed to be a Transformer. The whole gang heads to the mountain to secure an appointment with the monster and maybe get him to be a movie star. So, they run into Skullgrin, the Decepticon pretender who's trashing up the place. Of course, Skullgrin is in monster mode so nobody suspects that he could be a Transformer. Although, as I mentioned, both monster and robot are the same size. So, it would be a question of which version would give you a safer trashing. Now, Rowley makes a deal with Skullgrin to come on board as a member of his talent crew, and Skullgrin surprisingly shows restraint by stopping to consider his offer. In a flashback sequence, we see Skullgrin being instructed by his commander, Scorponok, to head to Earth and set up a fuel source there for the Decepticons' eventual landing. Now, of all the Decepticons in his armada, Specifically, why Skullgrin was chosen by Scorponok. Skullgrin, who looks like a decomposing bull with the body of a Viking ship, why he was chosen for this subtle mission is anyone's guess. Anyway, 
Skullgreen figures the humans can pay him in fuel and agrees to the offer. Now the area is surrounded by the military who want to prevent the danger from escalating. But get this, they let the team walk off with Skullgreen after the director mentions that he has Skullgreen under an exclusive contract to star in his movie. I mean guys, stranger things have happened for sure. But get the hell out of here! There is no conceivable scenario in which the military would let a civilian walk off with a 50-foot monster. So Skullgreen becomes a movie star and as his popularity begins to surge, he starts to draw the attention of Circuit Breaker who is constantly on the lookout for new Transformers to turn into burned out toaster ovens. Except she's not really sure if Scully here is a Transformer. So she stalks him at this press conference where Skullgreen gets to speak to the public for the first time. Now he starts off being really friendly, you know, uh, for a giant bull monster creature. But then a bunch of reporters start to piss him off by claiming that he's responsible for multiple deaths and acts of destruction. Which, to be fair, might all be true. But Skullgreen takes offense nevertheless and starts to go berserk in the process thrashing up the place. Then Carissa steps in and tries to talk him into cooling off. And Skullgreen responds to her gentle, soothing ways. I mean, just like a guy would when a beautiful woman tries to coax and persuade him. Now he says to her, I believe you, Carissa. You always been my friend. I stop. This was the first instance in the story where I suddenly paused and went, Whoa, what did I just read? Now, never before has a Decepticon responded to a human with tenderness. Also, for some reason, the writers decided to make Skullgreen talk like Grimlock. You know, because he had to come off as brutish? I don't know, man. Circuit Breaker is in a wheelchair at the conference and poses as Skullgreen's biggest fan, prompting Carissa to reveal to her that they will be doing a shoot of the film in a few days' time at the Grand Canyon, not knowing the chain of events that she's about to set into motion. The next day, Skullgreen and Carissa start getting chummy again in between shoots. Skullgreen tells her that he likes the fact that she cares about him. Now, I was a 12 year old kid in 1988 when I first read this and I felt that my whole world was shattering apart. It didn't seem possible that Decepticons could have emotions other than the desire to burn the cosmos. But here was a story that was rewriting all the rules. Now, whatever they were paying Badiansky to write this level of character development for a kid's toy comic book in the 80s, it wasn't enough. Now Carissa reveals to Skullgreen that her real name is actually Ethel Stankovich and that she's actually pretending to be someone else when she gets behind the camera. Now it's like a light bulb goes off in Skullgreen's head when he hears the word pretend and he tells Carissa that he's also pretending to be something he's not. At that moment, his shell opens and the true robot self of Skullgreen steps out. I gotta say that Skullgreen in robot mode is a pretty handsome, dashing looking bot. Also, I can't help but notice that in the comics, the pretender outer shell separates in the middle for the robot to be revealed. But in the actual Hasbro toys, the outer shell splits through an opening at the robot's side. Now maybe Hasbro allowed this change as the middle split transformation looked more realistic in a visually dynamic medium like the comics. Now what do you guys think? Anyway, Carissa is surprised at the reveal but not as surprised as everyone gets when Circuit Breaker suddenly launches into attack. She blasts Skullgrin with an electrical storm attack and reveals that she found out where he was thanks to the information that Carissa had given her. Skullgreen becomes enraged, thinking that Carissa had betrayed him 
and launches a ferocious counter-assault. It has to be pointed out that artist Jose Delbo is possibly one of the most underrated Transformers artists of all time. His action scenes and accurate depiction of the robots on paper were absolutely breathtaking. Now at one point, Carissa almost falls to her death from a crumbling ledge as a result of the battle and Skullgrim hesitates to help her at first until Circuit Breaker has a change of heart and reveals to him that it wasn't Carissa's fault. In another first for the franchise, there is a touching moment where Skullgrim tells Carissa, I sorry, I doubt you, Carissa. Friend should never doubt friend. Now I am a bit disappointed as to how abruptly the story ends with Circuit Breaker storming off and leaving our characters in a cinematic final panel shot at the canyon. But I guess there was no other way to wrap things up. At least we know for certain that not all Decepticons are complete assholes. In many ways, the relationship between Skullgrin and Carissa reminds me of some of the more offbeat Transformers cartoon episodes like The Girl Who Loved Power Glide, except that it doesn't feel like a jokey, throwaway one-shot. Rather, it's a progressive character build-up tale that's totally in continuity. Well, that's the video, guys. Let me know what some of your favorite Transformers comic book issues are. And if you enjoyed this, don't forget to show your support by liking, sharing, and subscribing. Thank you, and I'll catch you guys again soon.